God, hallelujah. If you've been oppressed by the devil all week long, it's time to put him underneath of your feet, praise God. Come on, it's time to stomp on the devil tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah. There's deliverance in the blood tonight, praise God. If you want to be baptized in the name, you can be set free tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God, hallelujah. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost here tonight. Praise God. If you don't feel the Holy Ghost in here tonight, there's something wrong with you. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. We have a couple visitors in the house tonight. Uh, Jocelyn Pinkney and Elizabeth Everett. Can we give them a warm welcome tonight? Can I just tell you? You're in the right place tonight, praise God. If you want salvation, it's here, right here tonight, praise God. This is what your soul has been looking for all your whole life, praise God. There's nothing better than receiving the Holy Ghost and being baptized in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, praise God. But well, we have a wonderful guest speaker here tonight, Brother Kyle Charles. Praise God. If you want to go ahead and come up here. Hey, let's get with the preacher tonight. Come on. He's preaching for us. He's preaching for our souls here tonight. Thank you, Brother C. Hallelujah. How many believe there's a sweet presence of God in this place tonight? Hallelujah. Oh, come on, somebody. How many of you are attached to what the Spirit is doing tonight? Hallelujah. 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 Begin to pray for this service and begin to ask God what His will for His this service was. And I really feel like there is a God who delivers in this place tonight. Amen. I can guarantee if you look left and right in here, you're going to see people that can, with a loud testimony, tell you that God has brought me from a mighty long way. Amen. He took me out of so many things. He brought me through so many things. He's kept me from so many things. Oh, come on, somebody. We began to open this service with that song, Surround Me, O Lord. And the first step to deliverance, when you begin to look into the scripture, I might get around to preaching sometime tonight. You begin to see people that they longed and they thirsted for the Spirit of God so much that it didn't matter the bondage, it didn't matter the issues in their life, it didn't matter their physical issues, it didn't matter their spiritual issues. They found a way to worship God Amen. because they loved His presence. Amen. Let's just lift our hands one more time in this place tonight. And let's welcome his presence into this place again. Let's say, Jesus, surround us in this place, Jesus. Surround our hearts in this house tonight, Jesus. Surround my family tonight, Jesus. Surround me, oh God, tonight. Let your presence fill me, Jesus. Oh, surround me, oh. tonight Jesus when his presence comes in everything else has to leave there's no room for all the things in your life that have been dragging you down when his presence surrounds you and when his presence fills your temple there's a God who says you know what I'm gonna fill you to overflow and 
My presence will drive out all those things, all those worries, all those issues, whatever you're going through. My presence is able. Oh, hallelujah. When he surrounds us in this place, hallelujah. That's my prayer tonight, Jesus, just to surround me, hallelujah, with your presence, Jesus. And I know that I took it back a few notches. I know we were bouncing off the walls. But over and over in Scripture, we see that when God speaks, most of the time when He speaks to the people of God, and He speaks to a person intimately, it's in a still, small voice. We don't have to be bouncing off the walls. We don't have to be flying around the sanctuary to feel a powerful anointing of God in this place right now. Hallelujah. You'll open your Bibles with me tonight. We're going to start in the book of Luke, chapter number 24. While you're turning there, let's continue to keep our pastor and his wife in our prayers. God would continue to protect them and bless them on their travels. Amen. Amen. It's also wonderful to have our visitors here tonight. It's good to see people that are returning to the house of God. People that have been in the house of God showing up with their mind ready to have a move of God. Amen. We're going to start in Luke 24 and verse 36. And when you have it, say Amen. Amen. The Bible says, and thus they spake. Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me, or in the common vernacular, it's touch me. And see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. You want to talk about a powerful one, God's scripture. We know that God is a spirit. So when we read that, we see that the only way to touch Jesus physically, to touch God physically, was to touch the man Christ Jesus. Oh, and when he said to touch me, he said to reach out and touch me. Because you're touching the very presence of God. Amen. And by this he affirmed their faith. I see a lot of people in today's world and they begin to say, how do I touch Jesus? How do I get in touch with him in an intimate way? Well, the church is the body of Christ. And so when you come into the body of Christ, when we lay hands on you and the spirit of God begins to move and we allow that spirit of reconciliation to begin to work in your life and you begin to see change and power come into your life, you are in touch with the very presence of God in this place. Hallelujah. What I want to preach on tonight, I know it's simple and I hope you guys bear with me while I lay a foundation, but... Behold the master's feet. Behold the master's feet. If you'll lift your hands, begin to pray with me right now that God would speak in this place tonight. God, we ask that you would move, oh God. Bless us in this place once again, Jesus. We need your spirit, oh God, to work on our hearts, Jesus. To open, oh God, the eyes of our understanding, Jesus. That your word, oh God, might make a change in us tonight, Jesus. That we might feel your presence once again, Jesus. And you would do a work in us. A complete work, oh God, that would empower us and strengthen us, Jesus. And give us freedom in your spirit. We ask and believe all these things in Jesus' name. And if you believe it, say, in Jesus' name. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's clap our hands one more time unto the Lord. Hallelujah. 
I'm sorry if I'm taking off my jacket a little bit early, but when Sister Charles or Sister Iman leads worship, she forgets the drummer has to preach tonight sometimes. If you all will preach with me, you may be seated. So I begin to pray tonight and I begin to seek God and I begin to think over the past few days. I really felt the spirit of God begin to lead me because he began to speak to me that there are people in this congregation. They're in a struggle with their faith. They're in a battle of faith right now. To where they continue to try to have faith in God. And it's a cyclical struggle to where they believe and trust in God and they pray to God. And then they don't see it come to pass. And because of this, their faith weakens. Before I get into what I'm going to preach on tonight, I want to open with a foundation that's just built on the premise of faith. When a lot of times people struggle with faith, and this is important to what we're discussing, because when we read our text tonight, we understand that he told them to look at his hands and to look at his feet. And the hands of God represent the blessing of God. And so many times as saints or people of God, when we begin to build up our holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, we begin to pray for the will of God. Oh, come on, somebody. And as we begin to pray for the will of God, we begin to see things done in our life. But sometimes as we've been in the church and as we've gone through things and we've been through trials and we feel like we've been in the church a while and we've received some things from God and we've received some truths in the spirit. We begin to ask for things and sometimes we don't see them come to pass. Now, I don't know who you are tonight or what you're struggling with, but God began to work on me and begin to say, when you see things that aren't coming to pass, you need to check that it's the will of God. Because the Bible says that our template is the Lord's Prayer where it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And so many times our faith gets wrapped up in, God, I want this right now. And we look at the hands of God and we begin to say, what can your hands give me tonight, Jesus? What am I asking for, oh God, that you can deliver unto me? And so many times we forget to say, is this the will of God? Is his kingdom come through this prayer? And if we're not careful, we'll become discouraged and we'll begin to say, well, God isn't listening to my prayer. I begin to think about this in James four and three. It says you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. And I begin to think, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that you're sinning. It means you're asking according to your fleshly nature. You're saying, God, I'm looking at your hands and I want you to bless me right now. And I want you to give me something that benefits me in the fleshly, in the natural. But God is saying, "Uh, uh-uh, it ain't time for that yet. It's time for you to step a little higher because I've got a spiritual blessing with your name on it. But what you're asking isn't my will. You're looking at my hands right now. Oh, come on, somebody. I apologize if I stop and start a little bit. I'm trying to preserve my voice until I get to preaching. Because I promise when I get to preaching, we're going to get down to it. So many times we have the issue where we compare ourselves among ourselves. And we pray and we say, God, Brother Seen's getting this amazing financial blessing. And I'm just using him. I don't know if he is. Don't think that I'm jealous or that I'm calling him out. I just know he has the right spirit. And you say, God, I want his financial blessing. But you have to have perspective in the spirit to understand that sometimes somebody else's blessing isn't your blessing. 
So many times we pray for financial and physical blessings. And God does want to bless you. But every person that I've seen that is financially blessed in the kingdom of God. It's because they begin to bless the kingdom of God first. Amen. Oh, come on. And as they bless the kingdom of God and they gave to the kingdom of God, the blessing of God financially overtook them to where they couldn't even contain all that they were receiving because everything that God poured into their hands, they just pulled right back on the altar and said, I don't care, God. I didn't start here and I don't care if I finish here. You gave it to me and it's still yours, Jesus. We begin to understand this philosophy in the scriptures. In Deuteronomy 8 and 2, it even backs up what I'm saying. And it says, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. The Bible even says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added. We don't pursue the material blessings of the world or the status of the world. Our faith is not in material things or in the actions of God but our faith is in God himself and when we begin to say God I don't care what I have tomorrow you're still good God I don't care what I have yesterday or today you're still worthy of all that I have to give that's what God says I see something in you come on a little higher I'm going to pour out a blessing Oh, come over here. I'm going to order your steps. You're going to walk into a blessing. And you begin to see as the favor of God begins to over and over continually bless that person's life. Now, I know some of you are looking at me right now and saying, well, I love all those things. Well, guess what, brother? If you love the world and the things in the world, the love of the Father is not in you. If you love money so much that you can't give it to God. Well, he says you cannot serve both God and mammon. And Brother Charles has preached that over and over. So if you want backup for what I'm talking about, he's saying you can't serve the physical blessings of God. You've got to serve God in the spiritual nature. When you get into that ethereal sense where God's spirit begins to move and you're now in the supernatural and God begins to speak and to lead and to guide you oh it's tight you don't have to get with me it's in the word you look at Job Job was a blessed man so many people say I want the blessing of Job well, do you want everything else he went through? Because you know what happened? When the devil asked God to remove his hedge of protection. God said, all right. Because I know Job is faithful. If you were a millionaire today, would you still serve God? Sometimes you don't have a blessing because God knows you can't handle the blessing. He looks at you and says, if I bless you with a million dollars, you're going to be lost three months from now. And we've got to get it made up in our mind that I'm serving you. It doesn't matter what I have. It doesn't matter what is given to me, oh God. I know that you are worthy. What you've done for me is already enough. When you forgave my sins, when you washed me in your blood, when you wiped away all of my past and my history and my sins, that I didn't deserve to have forgiven. And Job, he looked around and he didn't compare himself to brother so-and-so and say, why didn't you take all his kids and his wife and his money? When you're going through hard times, when you start looking at the people around you and blaming God, there's an issue with your faith, brother. And what I want to do is I want to help you build up your most holy faith. Because our faith there again is not in the action of God. When you begin to look 
Everybody in this world, they preach it. And that's where you've got to get the mindset of the denominational world out of your head. Because they believe in this sloppy agape, name it, claim it, grab it, claim it, have it. Whatever you want, you can have. You just got to claim it in Jesus' name. And God's looking at you and he's saying, no, you need to seek first the kingdom because I have a blessing in the spirit right now. And guess what? Where you are today, you're going to be worse tomorrow if you don't claim this spiritual blessing that's able to save your soul. Because above all else in this world, the most priceless thing you have is your soul. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let's clap our hands to Jesus. That's where we have to have perspective when we ask the will of God. I don't know what that was. Half of that wasn't in my notes. People don't like it when you preach on their money. But you begin to look and you begin to see that there are things that are in the will of God. And the will of God for some men is not the same will of God for other men or other women. There are some things that when you have perspective in the spirit, you understand that it's his will for everyone. Amen. Like it's his will to heal most everyone. Amen. I will say that when people are praying for a healing, when God doesn't heal you, if you prayed in faith, it's your job to write the check. Right. It's God's job to cash it. Amen. So if you don't receive your healing, know that it's not in the will of God because that says, you know what? When you begin to read in the scripture and, and some of John's disciples went to Jesus and he said, go and tell them that the dumb talk and the lame walk. He said that after that, he told them to leave and he left and many left that place without a healing, without a physical change. And the Bible even talks about he'd rather you go into heaven, halt or maimed than to be lost. He'd rather you have some physical ailment, but you make it through his gates and you live an eternity in perfection. Living with the one who loved you from the time you were created and begin to worship him. Then you to lose out with God because you have the ability that this world loves. It's also not his will that any would perish. So when you begin to look at that, you say, what does that mean? It's not his will that anybody's lost. Amen. When you begin to pray in faith, you say, is it the will of God? Well, it, brother, if he's telling you you can't receive the Holy Ghost, if he's telling you that you're going to hell, you need to turn around and say, no, you're going to hell. All right. Amen. Oh, come on, somebody. Amen. Because what he's doing is he is trying to undermine and destroy the foundation of the word of God where God says it's to whosoever will come and drink of my life everlasting and so he begins to tell you you're not good enough oh you've done too much to be saved oh come on but when I read it says then Peter said unto them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off even as many as the Lord our God will call and with many other words did he testify and exhort say say yourself don't save your brother. Don't save your sister. Save yourself and let God help you draw them in and say, come on, I know a better way. I know a brighter path. I know a way out of all that junk we've been doing. I know a way out of all that sin that we've been fighting. I know somebody that'll feel that emptiness that's been eating you on the inside. The last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Says your sons will 
see visions. Your sons and daughters are prophesying. Young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. They'll start to see the vision and the dream that God has for the kingdom of God. Not for the physical blessings of God. Oh, hallelujah. Let's clap our hands one more time. We begin to st study this scripture tonight. We understand the apostles, the way that the devil's insidious nature is to make the people of God at odds with the law. Now, hold on. This is some deep, everlasting point. When we're reading here, you see that everything, we even see it in today's modern times. There are preachers preachers that have been put in prison there are people that have been preaching the word of god and because of it they say oh that's hate crime that's but it's the word of god and it's going to come a day where when a man gets up and he begins to preach without fear or favor he's going to have to watch that back door knowing they might come in and take him any minute when we begin to look at this all of the disciples after jesus had been crucified they were terrified they were hiding they were trying to cover themselves and stay away from the law because they were worried that they might be the next one to be crucified. But they had faith in God. I started to look at this and I didn't know that every apostle was a martyr except for one. John the Revelator, or as we call him, Jesus called him John the Beloved. He was the only one. And man, if they didn't try to kill him, they boiled him in oil. They put him on an island without people. They tried to take that man's soul. And all he did was say, it's going to give me a deeper revelation in Jesus. And he wrote one of the most revelatory books in the scripture. Because his faith was strong. Began to look at Peter. Peter was a martyr and he, they crucified him in Rome. That's why some of you avoid the call of God in your life. Because you don't want to worry about the things you're going to have to go through from people around you when they begin to question your faith. Begin to attack your faith. Some young men with a call right now, you're running from God because you're worried about what the people in the world are going to say about you. And God's saying, my calling's a higher calling anyways. Why don't you step up a little higher? Because heaven and earth are going to pass away. But my word and my calling are never going to pass away. When you embrace my calling. Y'all may be seated. That's neither here nor there. Like I said, the, the anointing is on me. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to stay on track here. God has a message. We get to understand that Peter was a martyr in Rome. And as I begin to read this, it began to tear me apart because... He was crucified next to his wife. And when they began to take him to be crucified, he looked at them and he said, hang me upside down because I don't even deserve to be crucified the same way as my Savior. And it is recorded in history that as his wife was laying there on the cross, they held him to watch her be crucified as she was stripped. And she was humiliated. And she was belittled. And it's recorded. And I wrote this down because it was so powerful. Peter was reaching for her and weeping. And he was saying, remember Christ, my beloved. Remember Christ. Because he had had an experience with Jesus Christ. Amen. And they took him from that moment and they hung him upside down and they killed him. But his faith was strong unto the end because he had had a supernatural walk with the master. Where when Jesus was going through Galilee, he seen him heal the sick. He seen him bring about deliverance and power. But there came a moment in Peter's life and we understand this because 
he had a couple trials of his faith. The first we understand is when he denied the Lord thrice. And then he ran away ashamed and Jesus went to him and he said, come on, Peter, where's your faith? Come on, Peter, are you going to do what I've called you to do? Are you going to feed my sheep? Are you going to love me and what I've called you to be? And the second was when he was in this room and you begin to see that we read in this scripture. They and as they thus spake, they were standing in a room talking amongst themselves. I promise this is all going to tie together. We're about to get it. Jesus himself appeared. He walked. Now, if I seen somebody walk through that wall right there. I hope it's Jesus because I might be booking it the other way. Now, unless it's the Kool-Aid man, then he's going to have to fix that wall because Brother Charles is scarier than the Kool-Aid man. <laughs> oh, it's all right to have a good time in the house of God. And Jesus stood in the midst of them and he said unto them, don't be afraid. Peace be unto you. Don't be, don't be afraid. But they were terrified and affrighted. And suppose that they'd seen a ghost, a spirit. And he said unto them, why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? I'm telling you, I'm here to increase your faith tonight, brother, sister. The same man that preached at the day of Pentecost was sitting there afraid and frightened. He stood up and preached the message of salvation. And Jesus said, behold my hands and my feet. That it is I myself. Touch me. We sing a song that says touching Jesus is all that really matters. Brother, if you're having an issue with your faith. Sister, if you're having an issue with your faith in God. Why don't you just reach out and touch God? Because he's not far from any one of us. When you're in a crisis of faith and you feel troubled and you feel like I can't make it another day and the things of this world are bearing down on me and I'm depressed and repressed and I have issues and I feel guilty and condemned and I feel like the devil's after me and I feel like all the things in the world are going wrong. You know what Jesus is doing? He's saying, just come on, reach out and touch me one time. Come on, I'm going to increase your faith tonight. knew exactly how to restore their faith it was to touch him we look at his hands so many times because we want to see the activity and the blessing of God and we forget the second part of this scripture we need to come back to his feet Sometimes we get so focused on what God has given us, the things, and we don't worry about things. And if we're sick, we go to a doctor and if we need extra money, we just work a few more hours. And God's just saying, you need to come back to my feet at some point. Because prayers and needs are answered at the feet of Jesus. I'm going to prove it to you here tonight. The Bible says in Mark 5 and 21, we begin to read about a man named Jairus. And he found hope at the feet of Jesus. As he went to Jesus and he besought him greatly saying, my little daughter lieth at the point of death. Come lay hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live but when you read before that it shows that Jairus was a ruler he was an important man he had a lot of acclaim and he had a lot of people that respected him 
But when he needed something and he felt like he had no hope and he seen the dream and the thing that he had created and the promise that he had put his life in and he had put his love into and he probably cared for that little girl so much and he seen her laying there. He said, there's only one place I can go. And he ran and he fell at the feet of Jesus. And he said, my daughter, she's dying, Jesus. What can you do to help me? And we understand that Jesus, he's seen this man's faith and he went and his daughter was resurrected. When Jesus went in, they told her, you're too late. You feel like your dream is dead. You feel like your baby's dead. You feel like the promises that God has given you are dead. You feel like the people and the things you've been praying for in the spirit that are according to the word of God that are promises that he's given you are dead and God says no 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 you just gotta come to my feet one more time because I'm gonna go to your house and I she's not dead she's just sleeping you know what I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna breathe breath of life into her and she's gonna resurrect and that dream ain't dead no more honey that dream ain't lying there anymore but it's up and your promise is alive and well in your life again. <laughs> Hallelujah. We began to look at forgiveness that's found at the feet of Jesus. We begin to look at Luke 7 and 44 where he goes to Simon's house and he's surrounded by all of these people. And he's surrounded by the affluent. And he's surrounded by people with power. He's surrounded by disciples. What are disciples? They're saints. Oh, come on, somebody. And a woman came in and she began to anoint his feet with her hair. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house that gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou did not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. But to whom much is forgiven, the same loveth much. She fell at his feet. And she said, I know I got a lot of problems, Jesus. But I know that you can forgive me. And she found forgiveness at the feet of Jesus. Musicians, if you'll come, you can find wholeness at the feet of Jesus. You begin to read about the lepers. We read about ten lepers. And leprosy was an anathema. Everybody stayed away from the lepers. They were the outcasts of society. They were the broken. They were the discarded. We begin to understand that leprosy is a type of sin. And Jesus, he had ten of these lepers come. They all had this sickness that was eating away at their body. Parts of them were missing. They were ugly to look at. Society looked at them and said, you don't belong here. You need to go out and far away from us because you don't want to touch us with that stuff. But we read in Luke 17 and 15 how 10 were healed. But one found wholeness 
It says in 15, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice, he glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. The other nine, I begin to read this. The other nine were saints. He was a Samaritan and Jesus answered saying, were there not ten that were cleansed? Where are the nine? <laughs> you begin to read, there are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he saith unto him, arise, go thy way, thy faith had made thee whole. Can you imagine being at the feet of Jesus? And you begin to thank him for what he's done. He's healed you. He's given you something. And while you're in his presence, and while you're talking to Jesus, he's making you whole. Parts of you are coming back that you felt like you'd lost. Things that made you look ugly to the world are beginning to be restored in your life. And while you're laying at the feet of don't ever take too little time at the feet of Jesus. Take your time when you're in front of Jesus. Because just in that moment, God is saying, I'm going to make you whole. Just stay right here a little while longer. While you're praising me, while you're worshiping me. At my feet, I am going to make you whole again. We find that... There's mercy at the feet of Jesus. We read about the woman who was caught in adultery. John 8, verse 6. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. When they brought her before Jesus, they wanted to see what he would do. Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. What you have to say to me about this person doesn't matter. I already know everything that they've done. I already know where they've been. I know where they've been through things. I know what they've suffered. I know what they've faced. So I ain't listening to you. And so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and saith unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her and again he stooped down and wrote in the ground and when they heard it, being convicted in their own conscience they went out one by one you can see in your mind's eyes they slowly begin to drift away from that person that they were accusing oh well we all know that she's a problem we all know where she's been we all know what he was doing last night. Right. We all know who he was with. But when you begin to think about where God bought you from. And what God has forgiven you of. It's time for us to walk away from that accusatory position. And come back with hands that begin to pray with. And that's where Jesus looked. And they began to leave him alone with this woman she was fallen at his feet he said woman where are those accusers hath no man condemned thee and she said no man lord and Jesus saith unto her neither do I condemn thee go and sin no more she found forgiveness at the feet of Jesus she found his mercy was everlasting and she began to understand that I'm in the presence of somebody that it doesn't matter what I've been through he sees my heart and he knows I'm tired of this I'm sick of what I've been going through I'm sick of what I've been doing out there I'm sick of being what I am right now and he said go and sin no more lastly I began to read about the people that found deliverance at the feet of Jesus Mark 7 and 25 we read about the woman who came whose daughter had an unclean spirit 
and she fell at his feet. If you're bound tonight, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's addiction. It doesn't matter if it's fornication, adultery. It doesn't matter if it's what it is God looks at your bondage and he says are you going to come lay at my feet for a while because I have the power to set you free we begin to read about the man of the gatherings he was bound by a thousand a legion of devils and when he seen Jesus not one of those devils could stop him from running to Jesus. He was bound. He was conflicted. He was addicted. He was bothered. He was torn apart. But there wasn't one devil in hell that could stop him from running to the feet of Jesus and falling at his feet and worshiping him. You want to know that that bondage has entangled you, that sin that's entangled you, and it's holding on tight. Jesus is saying, come on up a little further. Fall right here at my feet. You begin to read in Corinthians 15 and 25. He says, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The Spirit of the Lord is here right now. If you have a need tonight, if you need mercy, if you need faith, if you need an increase in hope, whatever need you have, there is an altar where you can find yourself at Jesus' feet. If you come to this altar, Jesus is waiting and he's saying, it doesn't matter the situation. It doesn't matter the problem. It doesn't matter the sin. It doesn't matter the past. It doesn't matter the bondage that you're in. But if you fall at my feet, I'm going to set you free. I'm going to give you deliverance. I'm going to give you love. I'm going to give you mercy. I'm going to give you hope. I'm going to remove that condemnation. I'm going to give you power in my spirit. Let's come to this place. Let's find a place at the feet of Jesus. Let's begin to reach out to him. Let's begin to talk to him. Let's begin to cast all our cares at the feet of Jesus. There's nothing like his presence. Hallelujah. When we seek your face, He is here in this place. There is nothing like the presence of Lay it all at His feet. Oh, there is nothing like the presence of the Oh, that's Him. His presence is here. His love is everlasting. He said, come on, I'll wrap you with my arms, son. Come on, daughter of mine. Come on home. My mercy is waiting for you. My grace is waiting for you. I love you. I'm ready to move on your behalf. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, that's it. Let those tears fall in here. Jesus hears every tear. He sees everything that you're going through. He knows where you are right now. And he's looking at you and he's saying, come on. I've got a higher calling for you. You don't have to be where you were yesterday. There is nothing like the freedom of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 